Good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for coming. It's wonderful to have you here. My name is Lisa Melandri. I'm the executive director here at CAM and the curator for this wonderful exhibition, which is it, it is our privilege to have here at the museum, the work of Lewis Cameron. And it's also, I think, particularly a wonderful chance to think about Lewis's work um, and its kind of many forms, its many interests, and the different ways in which he comes to making work. We have right behind us one body of work, clouds, and across from you, on the wall next to the shop, there are the printouts from two different portfolios which come from the Poster Projects Presents uh, series. And so we'll talk a little bit about what makes these two bodies of work different. Um, how does Lewis work? But I do want to start by saying we were just speaking um, this evening and um, I was talking about uh, a, a painter named Donna Nelson who was based in Philadelphia, taught at Tyler School, which is where Lewis did his graduate work. And we were talking about painting and he reminded me that he was indeed, uh, his concentration was painting. And it kind of put a smile on my face because it made me realize that this work that Lewis has done over many years now, certainly you know, 15 to 20 years of work, is work that may have started in painting, but which has taken every possible medium, form, um, conceptually, and in terms of style and in terms of execution. So it's really, really interesting to sort of think about the evolution of this work. Um, and we had decided we're gonna start with the present and then work backwards to give you a little context. And so, Lewis, I would just love it if you could walk people through what it is that we see behind us, and then we can go to the Poster Project Presents, but what are these? How are they made? And what's the nature of this inquiry? And my personal interest is the difference between the content and the form, and what it is that you're thinking about when you make these works. And welcome, thank you so yeah, much for doing you. this. <laughs> uh, thank you for having me here, and thank you all for for coming. Uh, with the cloud series, it really came out of uh, experimentation and, I guess, play, where at a certain point, um, I looked up into the sky, looked at clouds, and there was this thing happening, um, I guess you call it um, Neko. Mm. <laughs> um. <laughs> what is it? What is this word? Really. <laughs> Nephilococologia. <laughs> which I know I, 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 I butchered it, but we, we kind of figured out what this is in terms of what it's called um, uh, this afternoon. So what I saw in the sky was, <coughs> and <coughs> excuse me, you talked about my experience as a painter. My painting mind interpreted the clouds as washes of white on a blue ground. And I said, okay, well, if this is the case, then how can I transfer this to a flat surface to, um, do something with it. While at the same time I was uh, working on Photoshop, um, playing around, and started exploring color in Photoshop, and came across a way to process the cloud images that I had been looking at. So what I ended up doing was taking three images and putting them each in a different color space, and then overlapping them one over another to produce the final image, but also to produce um, a different color, but also a sense of depth and space that wasn't necessarily present in it, the individual uh, cloud images. And in calling the series clouds, I was interested in identifying them as, you know, their source material and where they came from, but the tension that occurs when looking at the images, they don't necessarily appear to be clouds. You know, they kind of fight or resist that, that designation. Um, tell, can you share with us a little bit about, did you give yourself a system ever? Was it that you took pictures of the sky as you found some kind of uh, shape or texture in it? Was there anything where you were systematic about the when of it? My, my, my previous work was very systematic, mm -hmm. and I think I've changed a bit where I've, I've loosened up, I guess. And with this work, um, 
it's more casual, you know? When I'm walking down the street, I'll look up in the sky, and if I see um, something that interests me, I'll take my camera phone, take a picture, and then it goes into this archive that I revisit later on to work from. Now, you had, um, when we had met and talked, I guess it must have been a couple of years ago, you were sort of heavily invested in this idea of surveillance and surveillance yes. photography. Yes. Um, and so, you know, we, of course, um, have placed onto these works this idea of the documentation of the space around you, the documentation mm -hmm. of the sky, the same way that you had, you know, documented and surveilled other spaces. Can you talk a little bit about those sorts of projects and the, the difference of photography maybe in this looser state that you're in as opposed right. to those projects? Yeah, you know, uh, it was funny. Um, I was speaking with Eddie and um, Lyndon earlier when we were recording for the, uh, the audio tour, and they were asking, they were like, well, what is the connection between them? And I was like, well, not much. <laughs> and, you know, they're, they're essentially different lines of inquiry where I, I think in general, and what has been consistent within my practice is me following my nose wherever it leads me. So if I have an interest in looking at the sky, then I'll follow that. If I see, you know, like the walls of Berlin, and that kind of motivates me in some way, I'll follow that, and, and so on. So uh, with, I guess, in the text here and in the press release, they did kind of neatly package it and talk about space in terms of universal <laughs> space, of the, the sky that we all share, but also the space of the city in which surveillance uh, takes as its subject. And I, I feel like that is true. Um, <laughs> That's <I w> good. <laughs> what, <laughs> but, but what I would say is that um, there, there are different, I guess, motivations and cultural issues at play. Uh, this being more of a, uh, I guess, a universal experience that we all share wherever we are in the world versus an experience that is very urban and metropolitan, that being of uh, surveillance. So, for example, in London, you have the highest concentration of surveillance cameras in the world, in a city, so you're always on, uh, on camera. <laughs> and for that series that you're referring to, the actually, this might be an opportunity to use our screen here. So there were two bodies of work, the domain awareness and the Times Square Ring of Steel. Maybe this is loading. Okay, here we go. So this is an example of that work. So what I'm doing with this work is accessing webcams in New York City and then photographing um, people in New York City via these cameras. So, and I guess in, in uh, 2012, uh, the, the NYPD and Microsoft unveiled a domain awareness system. This is the title of this system that they developed where it's essentially a central nerve system where it's connected to 3,000 cameras as well as radiation sensors, wind sensors, and other sensors so that in the event of an emergency, everything is centralized in terms of where the information goes and they can respond quickly. And for me, what that signaled was New York um, pretty much being set on track to be like London mm -hmm. and have a very dense uh, um, concentration of surveillance and a culture of surveillance in the city. So, yeah. So, I also want to talk a little bit about color yeah. and your play with color and bring that back to older work as well. Because yeah. one thing that I think about a great deal, and as many of you may have seen um, at the St. Louis Art Museum, your work Heineken, but also referencing um, 
earlier works that were the kind of puzzle piece paintings. Yes. So work has always been really, the color rather, has always been really, really central to the way that you have created seemingly abstract images. And it's sort of through color that you have made representation by yes. affiliation. And I'm wondering, you know, you're talking about this play with Photoshop and mm -hmm. maybe a moment where you're dealing with color in a more poetic way, a freer way. Right. You're kind of allowing it to just tell you, you know, what's the pink, what's the green, what's the blue. Right. But certainly earlier um, mm -hmm. in your career, you've used it to absolutely tie something abstract to commodity, to retail, to a something recognizable. Can you? Give us some examples of that or talk a little bit about yeah, that. Yeah, sure. <coughs> Excuse me. So I guess at an earlier point in my career, I think maybe shortly after 9-11, um, I was making these floor pieces um, that were presented um, in freestyle and, you know, I was working on going into the residency in 2002 when I did the, the residency at the Studio Museum. And in that climate, after 9-11, I think, like most people in New York City, there was this heavy feeling of, um, like, I, I guess, self-assessment. Like, what am I doing? Um, what does it mean? Um, what can I do differently? Or should I do any, you know, anything differently? And I felt like I wanted my work to reference the world more, but also with a commitment to abstraction so that they, they both came together. So what happened was I was sitting in my studio one day and looked at, you know, what was in my studio, what was sitting on my table. I saw, you know, paper, a pen, a water bottle or whatever. And what I noticed was the color and how the color <coughs> created uh, the identity for the, the products and that they, in a way, spoke uh, far more than we normally recognize. So we have works such as the Color Bar series, and these are um, printing, um, the technical term, I'm not quite sure, but they're marks that you find on the inside of boxes that I'm sure all of us have seen. They're used to for quality assurance when something is being printed. And they're composed of mostly squares and sometimes circles. And in those squares and circles, you have the colors of the product or the ink being used to print the products. So in looking at those, I had a thought that they kind of look like monochrome paintings, <laughs> like these modernist abstractions. True. And then I was like, okay, well, what if they were? So what I set upon doing was making paintings based on them to create a, a conversation or a dialogue between the modernist aesthetic that I recognize within those markings, but also the reference to popular culture and the world, as I had mentioned, through the, um, the, com or the codification of the color. Mm -hmm. So, and then we move on to the puzzle pieces that are very similar, but just a different process of um, extracting the color, where I approximated the percentage of color in a logo of a product and uh, randomly selected um, that same percentage of puzzle pieces, painted them, and then put the, uh, the puzzle back together to create a color comp uh, composition that I couldn't really predict. So even in this work, there is this element of play, mm -hmm, in a mm -hmm. sense, but through a, a chance operation. So if we could switch to across the room yes. for a minute, yes. because I think that the poster project presents as a really, really um, interesting counterpoint to the kind of work that you do that is, you know, whether it's photography or film or video or painting, yeah. you know, you're talking about objects that are singularly yours, your authorship. Yeah. And what we have here um, in the poster project presents are two different portfolios. One is called I Am, one is called Immigration. And the most striking thing about this work is, first of all, the idea that it's a creation of a body of work that is open and free to the public, that anyone 
can have art, that anyone has access to art, right? So it's talking about art in this kind of much more democratic and open way. But then even more than that, it's the idea that there are so many artists involved in this. So yes. you are, you've kind of conceived of this, but there's not only the generosity on your part to think of what it means to give your images away, but the generosity of all of the artists who yes. are a part of it, who are similarly involved in this, you know, ability to say, yes, take this, this becomes anyone who wants it. So if you could talk a little bit, I'm interested in having you explain and kind of go through how you came to the subject matter for each of these, okay. but I think also just kind of this conceptual framework and um, how many people said yes and how many people said no and, and, and I mean it's actually very impressive how many different artists have indeed uh, agreed to this proposal of yours. Yeah, no, and I'm, I'm very grateful for the artists that have agreed to participate uh, in these portfolios. Uh, maybe I should explain like the, the origins of it. Please. And uh, they come from my experience with the, or I should say, my um, my experiencing the Occupy Wall Street movement and the occupation of Zuccotti Park in New York City. So during that time, I was teaching at Pace University, which is like a couple of blocks away, and I would walk by the uh, the park and see the occupation a couple of times. And the one thing that struck me about the initial occupation was how unvisual it was. And, you know, it was just mainly cardboard signs with markers. And, you know, I was kind of like, well, where are the artists? You know, what, what's happening here? So at a certain point after my second or third visit, there was this silkscreen station that popped up where you bring a T-shirt and they have a screen with um, slogans like, we are the, um, the 99% and down with Wall Street. And... I thought, okay, this is kind of interesting. And, you know, I have to say, I, I did, um, I did um, agree with a lot of what they were talking about and why they were protesting. And I felt like it was a delayed response to the, uh, the Great Recession yeah. and the economic um, kind of collapse that happened like a year or two before. So I thought, okay, well, what, what happens beyond the park? What happens after the park? Uh, and then I think maybe a week or two or maybe more later, I found this website that collected posters that people had produced uh, from, I guess, the global Occupy movement from all over the world. Um, they were PDFs collected on this website called OccuPrint. And I said, okay, Maybe I'll make a poster for this. I produced one, they accepted it, put it up on the website. And for me, that was a significant moment because for everything that I've done before that, I would mostly work on the computer towards the end of making a painting. And at that point, it was more of a, a fork in the road where I took a left instead of a right. And something else occurred that, um, that process was very satisfying to kind of make something and then have it out there, mm -hmm. as opposed to make something, have it sit in my studio, wait for somebody to come see it, wait for somebody to green light it, wait for you know the show, which would be months later, and then have it presented finally. So I um, started making posters, and the first ones, are, were for the Times Square Ring of Steel project, which is the precursor to the domain awareness um, project that I just showed. And these are images of people taken from a webcam in Times Square. So with these posters, there were paintings, but also this was a kind of complementary project that people could how did you get a hold of these images? How did you collect these images? Did you take these I did. pictures? Okay, so it wasn't that it was feed from a surveillance camera that then you kind of hacked into in any way. It was, but I, I didn't hack. So, so okay. okay, so 
<laughs> I mean, it's great if you did. I, there's certainly no judgment there. It's just kind of like, how do you get this raw material? So, so nowadays, you can um, do a search and look for a webcam in most cities in the world, and you'll find webcams that are kind of almost like a virtual tourism, right? So, you know, it's like, oh, right. so what's happening in London right now? What does Big Ben look like right now? What's the weather in London? You go and you access the camera, and anybody can access them. So I accessed one of those cameras in Times Square. What's happening in Times Square? You know, what are people doing? And actually, this camera was kind of good. Actually, this camera is now offline, I suspect, because it was like the quality and the resolution mm -hmm. was so good. But um, with this camera, in, it's a camera that is, you know, um, established by some, someone else. Um, I guess, um, positioned by someone else, and then I sit there, and then when people walk by, I click, the feed. and I take the picture. Mm -hmm. So in a way, it's, you know, it's almost like a cross-genre kind of thing, where it's surveillance, but also a kind of street photography, mm -hmm. in a way. So I collected these images, had an archive, or have an archive, similar to the domain awareness, and then I took the images and went through the editing process of selecting the ones that I would like to use. And you know, I think with this initial one, it really has to do with the people and the idea of profiling and who is watched, who is not. And I tried to get a rounded kind of selection to touch on the different issues um, that might come up in the process of um, surveillance. And also to question, you know, who, you know, or ideally when, you know, you the viewer look at it, you might confront, confront some of your own kind of um, filters in terms of, you know, who you profile and who is suspicious and who's not. So then from there, I started making other posters. And actually I made but a these posters were, so you, you collected these images and then you made them into posters, but did yeah. you have a, what was your kind of idea about distribution or how they would be shown or how they would be seen or if they were downloadable or if people picked them up in paper? Like what kind of, what were you thinking about for the final end product here? Similar to what we have here in the museum. So printed, mm -hmm. ideally on a nice cardstock paper, and then, of course, excuse me, you have them in your own personal space or you can put them in public space, if you so choose. And this led to other posters. Do you have any way of tracking how many downloads and who um, has taken, is there any? Be curious how people have found them, what they're interested in for, a, particularly for a project like that. Is there any right. one image that is more distributed or more, you know, downloaded and printed than another? Be curious. Yeah, not the downloads necessarily, but definitely visits to a page, so okay. I can track, um, you know, how much traffic I get to um, a specific page. Yeah. So, you know, after the Times Square Ring of Steel posters, you have posters like this one. And this references a NAACP mm -hmm. poster, or excuse me, banner, that was flown outside their office in Fifth Avenue um, in the, I think maybe the 20s or uh, here. Let me see if this link, yeah. So there's a picture of that. And what they would do is, Every time someone was lynched in the United States, they would put this banner out on Fifth Avenue to raise awareness about the, the issue. So I appropriated the design and the strategy of the banner. So with the poster a man was shot yesterday, the idea is that you have this poster and you put it um, in a public place, like, you know, whether it's the window of your house, 
uh, you know, the window in your office or some other very visible place to raise awareness of gun violence in your city. This came about um, after the, um, the shooting in uh, Newtown, Connecticut. So after that, I felt like, okay, this is, you know, this is a little over the top and what can I do as an artist to um, help make awareness, um, to do something? And I created this poster. And you know, the thing is also, in making posters, I'm very clear that a poster is not gonna solve any problems. Now, at the very best, a poster can help uh, make awareness and catalyze people to action. But I think also I see these posters as documents, uh, documents of culture, mm -hmm. so that when people look at these uh, 20, 30, 50 years from now, uh, they'll be able to talk about um, what was happening at that moment, and it'll be a document of what I was thinking about, mm -hmm. but also what was in the air uh, culturally. And I guess maybe here, and real quick. And then there were these posters. So these posters uh, came out of a similar impulse. And actually, these were created maybe the beginning of the year or, yeah, like this year. And of course, they're in response to recent events. They were used by a lot of people on staff here for the march. Yes, which I'm very happy with. <laughs> we so distributed them locally. <laughs> these are a response to the recent elections and the actually created for the parade, or parade, the, the Women's the March on Washington. So again, <laughs> Yeah, the day after the parade. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, right. <laughs> so again, you know, what can I do? What are my skills? Um, how can I help in what way, especially uh, living in Berlin? So again, I went to the, the posters and I created a suite of posters that were free and available for people to download and print out and use at the Women's March in Washington or at other women's marches across the nation or internationally. Uh, and there was, like you said, a lot of people from St. Louis, um, but definitely from other places that downloaded them and used them, which made me feel very happy that I did something and they were of use. So this is all um, you know, we're looking at a kind of way that you started working, and mm -hmm. it all has to do with this kind of free trade of messaging, of images, et cetera. But when you get to the portfolios, yes. you're implicating other artists in that as yes. well. And perhaps you're also um, more intentional about delving into a subject matter from different perspectives yes. than you are in this way, which you know these are language-based for the most part. Yeah. Um, so, t which came first, the immigration? Immigration. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, after the Times Square Ring of Steel set of posters, uh, my friend suggested, "Oh, so you are going to work with other artists to um, make portfolios?" And I was like, "Yes." I am. <laughs> so, you know, and I thought it was a great idea and it, and it seemed obvious. So I was like, okay. And my first portfolio was the immigration. It was in 2013 and uh, President Obama was gearing up to tackle this issue of immigration that seems to be, uh, I guess, coming up in a big issue every few years, every year. I don't know, but it's, it seems very cyclical. So I wanted to approach artists from around the world and get different perspectives uh, concerning immigration from different locations. So what I did was I went to the internet, since I was working on the internet, and did some research. Um, I think like half the artists I knew and half the artists I had never met before. I approached them 
via email, sent an email and said, introduce myself, told them about the project, um, who I was, who else was participating. <coughs> and there were a lot of crickets with some of them, like nothing. <laughs> While with others, there were some that were respectfully declined and yet others that decided to participate in the project. So I was very um, pleased and grateful for these artists to kind of come along with me on this project. Mm -hmm. um, there were artists from, uh, from Mexico, Morocco, the Philippines, Germany, um, where else, Los Angeles, um, Brazil. So, and this is in 2013. And, you know, in looking at those, they seem like they're very, and of course, 2013 is like, you know, like three years ago, but it, a lot of them are talking about the issues that are happening right now in the Mediterranean, in Germany, in the United States. So, you know, for me, I, I think it's very interesting that, you know, these things seem to be, uh, seem to stick around. Well, it's been know. interesting for us as well because when we were looking at these and deciding to put them up kind of literally, spatially in opposition to this work, we were thinking very, very clearly about how salient these exact same issues are now as when they were made between 2013 and 2015. And, uh, y you know, I would echo what you are saying that there are certain things there both as immigration pertains to not only the United States and what we think of as borders but there's a great deal in there from three years ago that has to do with all kinds of refugee and immigration yeah. status in Europe as well so again you know this is work that um, it's it's sort of terrible how salient this is, and particularly given what has been going on this week. And I'm sort of curious about that. So for you, and I've never asked you this before, if these are issues or moments or subjects or content that come back and change and shift, is that a done work for you? Or is there any space or chance that you would go back to it again at a different time? In other words, is that kind of a closed book? Yes, that's, that's, that's closed. And what may happen is I may organize another portfolio that maybe touches on mm -hmm. aspects of that, but would be a different portfolio. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then yeah. I Am? Then I Am. So I Am, that was published in 2015. And with that project, I asked, I believe it's um, 12 or it's like 13, 13 artists, yep. African American, or excuse me, black men living in the United States to um, create a poster responding to the killing of black men by police in the United States. So what I wanted to do was to, again, make it the, the geographic distribution um, as wide as possible. I think maybe it's a little New York heavy, um, I th and I did rely more on artists that I knew for this portfolio. So there are several or a few artists from New York, um, some from Los Angeles, Houston, um, Atlanta, Richmond, and yeah, there we have it. Now, I'd love to talk a little bit about when you were saying, for example, this idea of making the poster um, as somebody who's now living abroad yeah. and watching um, sort of the American reality unfold. And as somebody whose practice is very much engaged with a kind of activism and a kind of social engagement, mm -hmm. I'm wondering if you... Um, you know, sort of what's next for you and how you're thinking about it, particularly as somebody who is very happily in a yeah. new place, but a mm -hmm. place that is far away from the core yeah. of a lot of the inquiry that you have made throughout your career. So there is another um, portfolio in the, in the making that's dealing with what's, what's happening right now. So hopefully that'll 
um, within the next couple of months come to fruition and be published. Yeah. So it, it continues. It continues. And I guess the other question that I have in terms of a next step would be, you know, the difference between this kind of work and this kind of work. And you seem to be an artist who is continually making these bodies of work simultaneously. Is that indeed the case? Or are you going to be like all poster for a while? No, simultaneously. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> yeah, no all poster or all clouds. So, you know, clouds, posters, um, the surveillance um, themed works. Um, I recently um, produced another group of photographs based, you know, in that work. So it all happens at the same time. Okay. Yeah. Should we open it up to yes, questions? Yes, please. So let's open it up to questions if anybody has anything they would like to ask Lewis. What I, what I try to do, like when I do the portfolios, um, I try to create a grouping that is diverse, meaning that you, know, you have maybe more established artists, but then with younger artists. And in addition to that, also um, from different backgrounds. So yes, naturally that includes African American artists, but that would include um, you know artists from like you know the Middle East or from Asia or you know where I live in Europe. Yeah. Yes. 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 So so the um, the title refers specifically to that. The, um, the 1968 sanitation worker poster, I Am a Man. And actually, I think one of the posters um, appropriates that mm -hmm. um, poster more directly, the red one. At, but also, I Am kind of refers to um, I Am Somebody, which is a rally cry by Jesse Jackson in the 70s. And of course, um, I Am Trayvon Martin. So it's. I am is this statement of self-identification that kind of carries over through maybe a few generations that kind of I was referencing. Yeah. Yeah, it's kind of interesting. I, I think that maybe the way that I work within these pictures is a carryover from my experience as a painter where I feel the need to manipulate the material, where I think with traditional photography, um, people lean on the mechanical nature of it in terms of it recording a moment, um, uh, a moment in time, where I feel like, you know, I need to go a step further and I guess for me what it does is make these more subjective. So, you know, through the filter of me and through my manipulation, they they become a different reality and they're not um, some kind of objective documentation that is normally the case uh, within photography, or oftentimes I should say. Well, and you did talk about, I mean, I think it's pretty interesting that you've gotten to this when, when you were first thinking about the sky, you were thinking about, you know, a two color palette. Yeah. That yeah. was about the real documentation of what you were looking at and now you know, you're so far from that. Yeah. Both in the sandwiching of images and in the way that you've chosen the colors and the kind of painterly attention to the formal aspects. Yeah. You know, so it is it is a departure in many ways from anything that could otherwise be thought of as surveillance or documentation. Yeah, and I think these are made with my, my painting mind and then you have the surveillance-based work that is maybe more traditional in a strange way. Mm -hmm. Right, so they're, they're printed on a, a smooth uh, photo inkjet paper. So they're inkjet prints, and the, the whole process is digital. You know, I'm not a trained photographer, uh, so for me, it's very casual. I use the tools that are available to me, which are my mobile phone. And actually, I have to say, I do have a special you know, point and shoot camera that I use to have the images, you know, become this big. But I use my point and shoot and my computer, my laptop. Where, you know, of course, 
if we look over in the other gallery, we have Dina who, you know, she's a real photographer, right? <laughs> you know, she has like her big camera and then she's like That's under the right. sheet and then she has like her light boxes. And, you know, I, I like to think that um, maybe uh, my, the, my approach is more like a, a Dogma 95 where it's, you know, there are like these, <laughs> they're not exactly rules, but you know, I don't use artificial lighting. I, you know, use what's available, mm -hmm. and it's more it's more casual. Yeah, you know, I feel like I have like artistic ADD, and maybe you know, I I suspect that my uh, career maybe has suffered because of that, meaning that I haven't. Um, my work hasn't kind of uh, proliferated within the marketplace like some other artists because I don't have like a, a recognizable brand. And, you know, maybe for, for other issues. But <laughs> I feel like for me, it's important that I do have this freedom and I, I have to claim it. You know, I, I can't wait for people to um, tell me that you know, it's okay, you can do this, you know, it's, like I said earlier, whatever piques my interest, you know, I explore it, and at this point, I trust my decisions. Um, if it's good enough, I'll let it out of the studio. If not, I mean, there's a lot of stuff that just is just bad. Just like <laughs> failures that stay in the studio, nobody sees it, but there are other things such as these and the posters where, you know, I'm like, okay, I can let this out of the studio and then we see what happens. I mean, it's interesting that you ask that because part of that has to do with a process-driven way of working that's about experimentation, too. And I think what's interesting, I'll just speak to it as a curator who, I, you know, I met you in 2000, 2001, and yep. you were doing a very specific kind of work that I really responded to and was really, really interested in. And, you know, clearly I feel the same way about this, mm -hmm. but, you know, it's a completely new chapter. Now, what I will say is I do feel that there is like consistency of intention in your work. I know that's, that sounds like word salad a little bit, but there is something there about this kind of consistency in inquiry, I guess maybe would yep. be a better way to say sure. it. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, you're right. You are an artist who definitively, absolutely. And the second, I would say, that you have become recognized for a certain kind, like, because, you know, there are people who will say, oh, yeah, Lewis Cameron, that's like the puzzle painting guy. Yep. And then you just dropped that. Yep. Like, <laughs> and then it like went on stone, to the next thing. You know, yeah. so that is, I mean, that's really interesting with regard to actually the marketplace, because yeah. I do think that it isn't so unusual for us to say, oh, you know, oh, I really loved when you were doing that, you know, fill in the blank and this right. kind of movement within what it is that you're creating that changes. It can be, it can be hard. It can be hard for you in terms of career and, and market. And, and, you know, I um, was working with a dealer at the time when I was making the, the puzzle paintings and those, some of those paintings sold. Some of them are in museum collections and the dealer was, you know, encouraging me to make more right. and don't ever stop making those. And, you know, I said, you know, okay. And, you know, I just continued on with what I needed to do. And I think as artists, one needs to be able to have that freedom and take those risks when you feel like you need to. You know, I was just talking to you before the talk and, um, for young artists, you know, you just have to um, create your community, right? You have to go out there, put yourself out there, meet people. Um, with the poster project, you know, I relied both on the community that I had established um, living 15 years in New York, but also people that I had known from all over the country, as well as, you know, putting myself out there, right? And taking a risk by introducing myself to people over the internet, which might sound like, you know, an email scam, you know, <laughs> or something. But, you know, putting myself out there and then as a result of the risk, I created actually 
by a, a new and larger community uh, via the internet, which is like that's strange. pretty interesting actually. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So and those are real. Those are relationships. Those become relationships yeah, and yeah. a community of artists. And yeah, yeah. And I met the guy in Brazil. Came to New York. We hung out. Um, I'm trying to think if I met any of the other people I didn't know. I think maybe I bought um, a drawing or a collage from, you know, the artist from the uh, Philippines when she had a show in New York. So I mean, it. You know, I su I support her. You know and. You know, ideally, that would be reciprocated between me and maybe the other artists also. Well, thank you so much, Lewis. It is an absolute pleasure to have you here. And I must also say thank you so much to Barrett Barrera for yes. um, having you come here and having the chance to have you present at your opening from... Berlin, and it was also, um, I will say, very uh, meaningful for me to be able to work with you after, you know, I guess a 15-year block of time in between our first meeting and our most recent. But we thank you very much, and we are delighted to have the work here. Yep, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you.